everybody um, and thank you for for joining us my name is uh, Michael Krauss I'm um, the UBC leadership chair for addiction research and psychiatrist and uh, also in the department of psychiatry at UBC and um, um, my colleagues and and I are very happy to um, have this opportunity to present something uh, quite interesting to you. The agenda uh, for today is, uh, I will uh, give a short introduction, really short, five minutes. Then um, Dr. Tony Phillips will uh, share his uh, work on uh, the behavior pharmacology of TGIR or Heantos um, and, and uh, the opportunities from a basic neuroscience perspective. and. Um, then um, Dr. Azar, uh, who is the managing physician of CPAS and the Department of Psychiatry and VGH, beside a few other very important duties, will uh, share his uh, uh, ideas on clinical opportunities related to that. And uh, we will have hopefully uh, some uh, time for discussion and interaction between all of us. If uh, you can show your uh, nice background pictures and 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 video would be appreciated. If not, that's also um, not a big obstacle. So, um, uh, if you and if you're discussing, if you say probably a few words about yourself and 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 and, and your background, that would help also. To support the networking uh, and 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 the future discussions about that. So why are we doing that? Um, there is um, a very uh, kind of challenging situation in uh, the area of, especially in the uh, area of uh, treatment of uh, opiate dependence and uh, uh, overall uh, response to the opiate overdose crisis. And we're doing some work together with the department uh, at VGH in order to really establish um, um, clinical research and test and provide um, some important ideas on um, improved uh, interventions. So clinical research, especially around um, the effects of specific clinical strategies and also to develop new, uh, more effective interventions. Um, and we want to bring together uh, the different areas of research and different research perspectives. So um, from uh, the typical um, framework for translational research from uh, let's say pharmacology, but from field research to from uh, clinical research in a general sense and um, then a, a strict, let's say more phase uh, GCP studies from phase one to phase four. So a little bit of background. Um, uh, we, that means uh, Tony Phillips and myself are involved with uh, the uh, Vietnamese Institute of Phytochemistry and the Academy of Science, which developed and working for about 30 years on a um, natural health product called Hyantos in Vietnam, which is a uh, um, combination of 13 different ingredients and uh, 12, 12 of them herbs. And the main purpose of that is um, uh, the treatment and management of opioid and opiate withdrawal in Vietnam. In Vietnam, there were uh, some clinical research studies done on that. Um, but not to the degree that it could be regulated in, um, for instance, in Canada. So we are very interesting to better understand that. And uh, one of the most important steps of our, beside the clinical research and the international establishment, uh, established co collaboration is the great work um, uh, Tony uh, and his team it did in the lab for behavioral uh, pharmacology, 
and he will now from his perspective give you an introduction on on their work and uh, about his uh, assessment of Fiantos as a potential ingredient for uh, clinical interventions. So th thank you, Michael. Um, I'll share my screen in a moment, but I just wanted to introduce myself as well. Um, I'm in psychiatry, as Michael said, but my background is in neuroscience. And we've been studying the role of dopamine in many different aspects of behavior and mental ill health including addiction. And so what I'm going to talk about this morning is really an example of something that's gaining traction. It's called reverse translation. And here the idea is that you look for clinical insight for new opportunities to treat important disorders such as addiction in this case. Uh, but then the reverse translation comes about when you bring that clinical insight into a preclinical, much more rigorously scientific perspective initially, um, to gain some understanding of two important principles of a new drug. One is to try to understand whether you can identify a mechanism of action. And the second thing is, um, can you get any evidence that, that something from that complex formulation, in this case, a botanical formulation, is something uh, giving you a marker that could be observed in blood, and ideally observed in brain so that you can then look at the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of that as you would from a single molecule. So that's the daunting task that my colleague, uh, my colleagues, but led by, sorry, Michael, I'm just trying to get my, can people see that share? Okay, okay thank you. It's not full screen for me, but that's fine. Uh, anyway, so this is the team. And uh, the lady second up on my right is Soyeon On, and she really led this project and, and uh, saw it from start to finish, along with her colleague Haiyan Zhu on, on to the left of her. And then Maya Nesbitt played a really important role also in helping us with the mass spec data that I'll show you briefly. So we have this team, and we've had undergraduates and other graduate students involved in this project over the years. And this is a report that we uh, published uh, at the end of 2020, which summarizes about four years worth of work. And, it, and it, I'll show you in a few moments the data that's, uh, that um, have given us insights into both the mechanism of action and have confirmed that we could measure uh, a key ingredient in the Hiantos formulation in both blood and brain of rat. And so we can look forward to having a better understanding of its pharmacokinetics. Tony, so, go, into the, don't go into the presentation mode in PowerPoint. Thank you. Great, thanks. Now then, the other. Good. Um, so since we have clinicians in the audience, um, here's the courtesy of um, presenting competing interests. So I have a patent on a compound. It's not discussed today, but it is in the same category of compounds called tetrahydroprotoberberines. Um, so and we're actively pursuing its possible use in improving cognition. Um, I, we've also started a company called Resilience Biosciences, uh, which is focused on tetrahydroprotoberberine drug development. And these two other indications relate to our colleague in uh, Vietnam, Dr. Sung, who uh, has a company called Namet Pharmaceuticals. And then all of this in Vietnam is under the auspices of the Vietnam Academy of Science. And we acknowledge the, the fact that these discoveries are their discoveries and that we are um, trying to work cooperatively to bring this to uh, broader cl clinical practice. So the sum, oops, I can just give you the summary. It didn't come up on this one, unfortunately, but um, I'm, I'm laying the groundwork right now. So I'm going to, be describing to you some um, fairly detailed uh, preclinical studies uh, initially that are a combination of both neurochemical analysis and behavioral analysis in the same animal. Um, and the animals are rats that have been made dependent on morphine by experimental administration of the drug for seven days. Uh, and then we um, precipitate withdrawal by giving the animal naloxone. 
So this is a microcosm of what's sadly happening on the downtown east side where people are addicted and some, well, when they take an overdose, they're often revised, re revived by giving an injection of um, naloxone. In our case, what we're doing is precipitating withdrawal by that means of giving an opioid antagonist. And then as you'll see, we can measure dopamine and we can measure behavior um, uh, as the animal goes through these different sequences. So let's just move to the data section of the, of the slide. And here is the first figure. And don't be intimidated. The top of all of these have a cartoon on them. So let me just introduce you to that cartoon. So obviously rats are experimental subject. Morphine is the opiate that we're using. The animals get 10 milligrams per kilogram per day for seven days. Then we, on day eight, we give them naloxone to precipitate a withdrawal episode. And then 30 minutes later, uh, we give an oral gavage of the Hiantos formulation. So it's administered in a capsule form to humans. And, and incidentally, 10,000 people have taken this um, formulation in Vietnam to assist them in withdrawing from their dependence on opioids. So it, we know that it's safe from the human perspective. Dropping down to panel B here, um, what you can see are, are microdialysis data. So these animals all have a cannula placed into a part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens, which is a prominent terminal area for dopamine systems. And we do, using a push-pull cannula, we can collect samples, which we then put through an HPLC uh, analysis system, and we can measure very accurately dopamine in various parts of the brain. So then we get a, a baseline measurement, which we indicate as being 100% as the baseline. And what you can see immediately is that in these dependent rats, when we inject naloxone, we confirm what is uh, known in the literature. It hasn't been studied all that intensively, but we see this drop in the dopamine signal uh, immediately after naloxone precipitation. This is called a hypo, it's down here on the title, a hypo, a suppressed dopaminergic state. And if the blue here, if you just leave the animals for three hours, it stays suppressed while they're in that withdrawal state. And here's the really remarkable thing. So after we have induced this suppression of dopamine by initiating withdrawal, we then give hiantos. And you can, and each one of these is a 10 minute sample. So within 20 minutes, we've already restored the baseline dopamine signal back to baseline, but then it keeps going uh, up about 40% above baseline and is sustained at that level again for the three hours. Now, the wonderful thing about this preparation is that simultaneously with measuring the dopamine in this freely moving animal, we can also take um, somatic um, measurements of signs of withdrawal. So grooming, wet dog shakes, um, sorry, uh, rearing and um, what's ABS? <laughs> anyway. Um, all these signals are reliable indicators that the animal is in a withdrawal state. And you can see that in blue, the, the withdrawal scores are quite prominent. And when we give Hiantos, we suppress each one of these um, individual aspects of withdrawal. So here in a nutshell is the basic thing that we found initially. Uh, we knew previously that Hiantos would activate the dopamine system, but we were really, um, delighted to see that we could reverse both the um, behavioral signs and the neurochemical signs of withdrawal. So that laid the foundation for some other fairly uh, intense experiments. I'm not gonna, I, I just wanna give you a couple of take home messages from this slide um, because we're now into the phase of the experiment where we're looking for a mechanism of action. Now, Many of you will recall that uh, the way in which dopamine is regulated at the synapse very often involves the role of a specialized receptor called an autoreceptor. And it sits on the terminal. And when dopamine occupies that autoreceptor, it serves as feedback inhibition and shuts down the dopamine system. So even in the baseline state, there's probably some autoreceptor inhibition of, of the levels of dopamine that are being released on a tonic basis. 
But when we give a drug, which, um, so these animals in this experiment are not dependent on morphine. We're trying to get an assay that would allow us to look at whether withdrawal affects the autoreceptor. And this was a basic experiment to confirm that we had the right assay. So very briefly, if we give a drug which substitutes for dopamine, so it's called quim uh, quimperol, and it is um, given, and you can see immediately that as that agonist occupies the inhibitory antagonist, you get this wonderful suppression of dopamine. And the drug is being reverse dialyzed. It's, it's coming out through the dialysis membrane into the brain region of interest, the accumbens, at the same time that we're collecting the samples of dopamine. So this is your basic thing. You can enhance the uh, inhibition and create a hypodopaminergic state purely pharmacologically. Then if you use a drug that's an antagonist to Quimperol, which is called aticlopride, by itself, aticlopride raises dopamine. But when you combine the two, aticlopride cancels the effect of the Quimperol and thereby removes the autoreceptor inhibition. D is re blew, me, blew me away when, when we got these data. Michael alluded to the fact that Hiantos is comprised of the herbal extracts of 12 different plants that are used traditionally to treat opioid withdrawal in Vietnam. The group in Vietnam who are really master um, phytochemists have analyzed the, that formulation and they know that there's 194 different phytochemical compounds in Hiantos. Okay. So what we do in this experiment over here, it's a very, it's a single molecule. Over here, it's the entire thing that the person is being given to assist with their withdrawal. So again, we induce inhibition by using this Quimperol assay. And here, instead of using a, a single molecule to antagonize that receptor, we use Hiantos. And you can see in green that there's immediately a turnaround uh, in, in the signal uh, right here. Uh, replicating what we saw over here in, in principle. Uh, and then we do different doses. So it's a dose response relationship. And so something in Hiantos is acting as a dopamine autoreceptor antagonist, okay? This is a mechanism of action. It's really important data to give you confidence that there's something in this mixture that's having a profound effect on the very brain systems that are being modulated both by opioids and especially by opioid withdrawal. Then we did a very brave thing with Maya's assistance. Uh, brave in that, you know, there's absolutely, in my mind, <laughs> very little chance of actually seeing a signal here. So now what we wanted to ask is if we give a rat the full Hiantos formulation, can we find any individual molecules that would that we know from other literature might be effective in um, treating addiction? And so there's a literature on the class of drugs called tetrahydroproteoberberines and their involvement in addiction and other aspects of uh, mental health. Um, and, and one in particular caught our attention. It's a compound called L-tetrahydropalmatine. And so we asked the question, can we detect L-tetrahydropalmatine, LTHP, in, in both the blood and ideally in the brain of a rat that has just been given the full 194 molecules that comprise Hiantos? So the um, little diagram in B here is the, that's the chemical composition of L-tetrahydropalmatine. Um, and it actually fragments into two different uh, components, each of which under mass spec give you a different uh, peak. So this is, this is giving, doing a mass spec of LTHP. Okay, that's, that's what it is. Then we come along and we do the same analysis in blood plasma and we can see the peak. Uh, um, this is the standard LTHP and at exactly the same uh, retention time, you see the peak that corresponds to LTHP. And that's the blood plasma level. And then you come over and you do a, as shown in this cartoon, we can, um, in a living rat, extract a small sample of cerebrospinal fluid 
through the Cisterna Magna, do the same mass spec analysis and see exactly the same peak uh, in the cerebrospinal fluid of the rat. So at this point, I mean, that's a Im very important piece of information because there's something within the Hantos formulation that is related to other single molecules that are used in China uh, as potential addiction medicines. And here we're finding it in the composition of Hiantos. The thing about these experiments that really made us exciting, excited is that we could use this now as a biological marker. And so now we have a tool to look at least with respect to this molecule, what is its time course? What are its pharmacokinetics and dynamics, which is what you would do if you were doing single molecule neurochemistry. So we've answered two questions here. We've, uh, I think, offered a mechanism of action. We're not claiming it's the only thing that happens, obviously, but we think it's a very uh, plausible uh, contributor to the effectiveness of this medication in uh, facilitating withdrawal from heroin, uh, morphine, opioid dependent. And then we come along and now we've got this single molecule. So the next question we asked is, well, might this single molecule replicate the effects on our autoreceptor assay that I showed you earlier uh, with, with Hiantos and with selective antagonist? So uh, in B, uh, what we show, again, this is the quimperol inhibiting dopamine. The um, effect of LTHP by itself is to activate the release of dopamine. And when you, when you initiate the hypodopaminergia and then you apply uh, um, LTHP, you can see it blocks the suppression of dopamine. Then when we came over on the right-hand side, uh, we wanted to compare LTHP with another known single molecule that has a very selective dopamine autoreceptor antagonist. It's called a ticlopride. And so ticlopride is in red and it mimics the effect of LTHP. Its time course is different. It, um, the, the, the red is the um, LTHP. Um, it doesn't have as long an action as does the ticlopride, but nevertheless, it's giving us a, a very comparable signal. So again, this suggests that LTHP uh, has many of the properties on its own that are observed when you give a rat the entire Hiantos formulation. And then finally, we uh, did the experiment again with rats that are dependent on morphine. So this, this picture here is identical to the first one I showed you when we used Hiantos alone in order to reverse the hypodopaminergia and to suppress the withdrawal signs. Uh, only here, we're not using Hiantos, we're using LTHP by itself. So again, you precipitate naloxone withdrawal, you get the hypodopaminergia, and then we give, um, uh, as I say, uh, LTHP, which is the red squares, and it immediately reverses the, um, the hypodopaminergia uh, and then gives you an increase in dopamine. And then um, this ticlopride is the drug I was just referring to, which is a selective autoreceptor an um, antagonist, and it does the same thing. And then of course, we were able to show in the very same animals that were suppressing the withdrawal signs as shown in C. So that's the story, Michael. Um, and the reason why I like this set of data is um, because to me, uh, you know, I know that you um, are really interested in the clinical implications here as am I, but to my mind, this puts this whole story on a very, very sound um, neuroscientific basis. You know, it's not mumbo jumbo in 194 different herbal extracts. It's, there are key <laughs> molecules in here that are having profound effects on systems in the brain that we know are implicated in opioid um, uh, use and also opioid withdrawal. So if you were trying to take this through to the FDA to try to get um, uh, a, a new drug application or hopefully eventually approval, these are the sorts of data that you'd need for a conventional uh, FDA approval of this compound. But fortunately, this compound is actually 
categorized as a, um, as a herbal uh, product. And it's regulated by the uh, natural product branch of Health Canada. So over the last year, we have submitted all of the data um, that pertain to the Hantos formulation to Health Canada. They've uh, looked at the evidence uh, for any uh, toxicity or any inappropriate molecules that are in this formulation, and they've given it a clean bill of health. So we now have a license to import Hantos into Canada as a natural product thereby laying the basis to bring this whole story up to a clinical level, which is the segue into Puya's presentation. So thank you very much. So hope it wasn't too heavily science loaded, but that's what we do. Science is good. Science is good. We are all science here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Puya, you want to take it from there? Sure. Okay, can you guys see the slides? Yep. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Phillips. You know, um, as clinicians, we often uh, kind of bask in the benefits of uh, basic scientists and all the hard work that they do. Um, and uh, uh, we do the fun stuff, which is uh, applying it in clinical settings. Um, and sometimes we end up looking like the superstars. <laughs> People forget who actually did the, all the hard work behind the scenes to, uh, to kind of get us to where we are. But um, so my name is Puya Zar. I'm a pain addiction uh, psychiatrist. Um, I work on the complex pain and addiction service at VGH. So that's an uh, inpatient consult service where we, um, about half of our work is a pain medicine and the other half is addiction medicine. And um, there's a tremendous amount of overlap in between. Um, I also work on the at the Transitional Pain Clinic, which is an outpatient pain clinic for patients who have had surgery and have been discharged, but have ongoing uh, struggles with pain and or may require opioid deprescribing. Um, and another hat is working in the community with Foundry Vancouver, um, where I do um, uh, addiction psychiatry for... Um, adolescents often struggling with mental illness and um, addiction, as well as homelessness, et cetera. Okay, so moving on, um, no disclosures, no relationships with uh, commercial interests, um, no um, consulting fees, no commercial support. Um, okay, so now in our work um, in pain and um, addiction medicine, you know, we often struggle to find a balance. Now, our initial goal when it comes to analgesic management, now this could be a patient who's had surgery and is post-op, it could be a patient who has a new onset um, painful condition. Um, and so the balance is always to maximize analgesia while minimizing harm. And what I mean by this is, you know, we try to maximize analgesia by using in the acute setting, and this isn't chronic pain, we're talking about sort of new onset pain, by using as many different uh, mechanisms for analgesic control as possible. So we call that a multimodal analgesic approach. So that could be NSAIDs and acetaminophen and ketamine infusions, lidocaine infusions, neuropathic pain agents, cannabinoids. But um, sometimes we will ask for regional blocks, but it's rare in the pain and the acute pain setting where we can get away without using opioid analgesics they still remain the most effective analgesic agents that we have. However, as we know, and we'll talk a little bit about, is you know, there, there are complications associated with opioids. You know? So that's where minimizing harm comes in. So you know, we, we try to avoid opioid dose escalation because you know, the obvious side effects, excess sedation, decreased respiratory drive, aspiration events, delirium, opioid-induced hyperalgesia, you know, GI side effects, nausea, vomiting, constipation, as well as we want to try to avoid, um, uh, very importantly, new persistent opioid use. So this could be a patient who comes into hospital with a car accident, has acute pain um, needs, um, and we're trying to employ this approach. Now this gets even more complicated when we have a patient with opioid use disorder or who comes in on high doses of opioids for acute pain. And now we're trying to do two things. We're trying to minimize opioid withdrawal in a patient who's opioid tolerant 
while maximizing analgesia and minimizing harm, particularly opioid escalation. So this can make a very tricky balancing act for us. And so one might ask, you know, like what is, what is you know, the harm with, with using very high doses of opioids in hospital, aside from the obvious side effects? And there, there is evidence around ongoing persistent opioid use after surgery in hospital. Um, and, th and this is a conclusion out of this paper that new persistent opioid use after surgery is common and not significantly different between minor and major surgical procedures. Okay, and then the natural question might be, well, what's the harm of that? So that's where we start to get into the opioid overdose epidemic. This is a graph, um, this is data out of um, Ontario. And it talks about opioid uh, related deaths as a function of um, specific opioids. So we can see oxycodone right here. It was heavily marketed and pushed in the mid to late 90s. And we can see that opioid related deaths increase with the increase in um, oxycodone prescribing. Now, something interesting is that in the background, we're starting to see fentanyl related deaths also creep up. And now that's associated with the illicit fentanyl uh, market and illicit fentanyl use. So now here's this interplay between pain management, prescription opioids, and illicit opioids on the market, both of them ultimately resulting in opioid overdoses. And that brings us to the opioid overdose epidemic in British Columbia. Uh, many of you have seen these, these graphs, and um, this isn't actually the most up-to-date data, which is even more dramatic. But as you can see, um, as you know, between 2015 to 2020, we've had this dramatic increase in the number of overdose deaths. And just to put that in perspective, at the height of the HIV AIDS epidemic, um, 1993, we had 655 deaths. You know, in 2020, we had um, you know, over, well over 1,000 um, deaths due to opioid overdose. So how does this relate to Hiantos? Well, you know, like I can imagine um, the clinical applications of this type of compound. You know, we'll start with pain um, analgesic management applications. You know, like what if we had an agent that has some opioid-like effect, has analgesic benefits, but is not an opioid? You know, can this be used as a new monotherapy analgesic agent? You know, either in the acute pain setting, you know, chronic pain, or even in the palliative uh, medicine um, setting, to help um, in increase analgesic control without some of the side effects and downsides of opioid use, of opioid analgesics? Could this be used as an adjuvant uh, to a multimodal analgesic regimen? Could this be another mechanism we can employ in optimizing analgesic control in acute pain settings? Now, what often happens um, in hospital is we'll, we'll get called to see a patient. Now, they may be two weeks post-operative um, and their opioid use in hospital may have escalated. Now this could be is a person who has never used opioids before, no history of opioid use disorder, but now they're getting ready for discharge. There's no surgical or medical need for them to be in hospital, but their opioid use is exceedingly high. And now we're faced with a scenario where we have to start deprescribing opioids rapidly in hospital. Um, and so can this be used as, a, as an adjuvant for an opioid taper where you're providing some of that opioid effect where you're minimizing opioid withdrawal as a tool when we're deprescribing opioids in hospital. And similarly, can this be used in the acute or in the um, community um, uh, setting where we may have patients who um, have chronic pain and may have been on opioids for sometimes decades. Maybe now they're getting older and maybe now there's a need to start tapering the opioids can we use this as a tool to avoid the suffering that might be associated with opioid withdrawal in the long-term taper to, um, to make the prescribing more comfortable and rapid in an outpatient setting? Certainly um, this could be in a place like the transitional pain clinic where I work, or it could be in a primary care setting where you, know, you have a number of um, family physicians who are struggling with this very uh, clinical scenario where they have either inherited patients who are on high dose opioids um, or the patient may have got, gone there in, an, in another way and now they're, they're tasked with the difficult job of deprescribing the opioids. Now, what about addiction uh, medicine applications? Now, certainly um, if there is a way of using this molecule, these molecules in a, for monotherapy analgesic management, 
Could this be an opioid alternative for patients with a history of opioid use disorder uh, to avoid opioid escalation um, in these patients and potential relapse? Again, could we use this as an, an adjuvant to avoid escalation in an acute pain setting? Now this, this, this other point is perhaps the most important and I, I probably should have highlighted this because it, this could be a potential game changer or paradigm shift in terms of the way we manage um, patients with an opioid use disorder. Because when we start patients on opioid agonist therapy, you know, this could be uh, methadone, for example, as a replacement for illicit opioids or prescription opioids, we often start at a low dose. Um, and that's been uh, deemed safe as a starting dose for patients with opioid tolerance. But we know that probably 99% of the time that dose is not adequate. It, won't, it will not meet their opioid requirements and patients will continue to experience cravings and withdrawal and will likely continue to use illicit opioids sometimes for weeks during the titration phase until we can bring their methadone dose up to a level where now it's meeting their opioid requirements and they're no longer experiencing cravings and withdrawal and um, they're no longer needing to use illicit opioids. So what if we had another agent that we could use during this titration time that can provide some opioid effect, that can minimize uh, the negative effects of opioid withdrawal and potentially minimize the need to use illicit opioids while we're titrating the opioid agonist therapy in the background. Um, this could significantly change the way I practice addiction medicine. And finally, you know, like we don't uh, by practice detox patients in hospital because there's a number of negative um, outcomes that, that, can, um, that can happen when you detox patients from opioids. Um, and in, in brief, you, you can risk decreasing their opioid tolerance, not providing any agonist effect. And if that patient relapses, they are now at a higher risk of overdose. But at times, you know, you, find, you have patients where detox is their goal and they're not interested in being on opioid agonist therapy. So now I wonder if we can use this, uh, this substance first as, as an opioid-like adjuvant during the opioid taper or during the detox period to avoid again the, the, the very um, difficult uh, symptoms of opioid withdrawal to minimize withdrawal uh, discomfort. And really the other question that comes to mind is could this be potentially used as a maintenance um, therapy for patients with opioid use disorder who are not interested in being on opioid agonist therapy? Could this potentially provide some opioid effect without the negative consequences of, of full agonist opioids in hopes to minimize relapse onto illicit opioids? But these are all questions that you know, I would love to investigate and, and, and do clinical trials on. Um, because I think the, the applications of this type of uh, compound are uh, profound uh, when it comes to pain and addiction medicine. So that's really the end of my uh, presentation. Um, Thank you. Absolutely. Could you stop sharing, please? Here we go. Thanks so much. Um, I think really, really good idea. I would just like to add another fact to what you said in terms of maintenance um, uh, is that in uh, Vietnam, uh, the observation is that uh, people are using less if you give them a low dose of Fiantos because it has an impact on craving, uh, which may be an interesting mechanism uh, to, to look into. Yeah. But I will not yet now extend the presentation um, and I wonder whether there are um, some questions to both uh, speakers. Please don't be shy and, uh, and show yourself uh, even if you're sitting there in your pyjama. So Michael, to kick this off, and thank you, Puya, that was a fantastic uh, presentation. Um, I just want to make two quick points. One is that there are no opioid like mechanism or molecules within the Hantos formulation. Okay, so it's not an opioid substitution in, in any way. And the second point uh, that really relates to what you were saying 
is people over, often overlook the fact that during withdrawal, there's actually a hypersensitivity to pain. So ironically, you're taking a course of medication to you know, suppress your, your Oh, okay. Um, yeah, you know, I think everybody working in, 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 in pain uh, treatment is, is aware that these special hypersensitivity effects of opiates uh, are sometimes making things worse and, and not that effective. But all the other, I think that the, the topics you, you mentioned in terms of pain application and also addiction application are all relevant. They're all mainly uh, also there is based on the pharmacology also of uh, Hyantos, there is effect on, on pain to be uh, expected. Then there is an effect on any gastrointestinal uh, symptoms, which are also critical for, for the different target population you mentioned. And um, then the effects overall on withdrawal. And for, yeah, th these are the, the, the three main areas we, we, we want to target in, in the next steps of clinical research. Okay, are there other questions now to Puya or to uh, uh, the, uh, to Tony or to others uh, uh, right now? Did you run out of power, Tony? Uh, kind of a question, kind of a comment. I recently, I'm one of the psychiatry residents and I was recently doing a rotation of EC cancer. And there was a lot of discussion about kind of the effects of long-term opioid use for pain and how that impacts mood as well. And so um, just seeing kind of like the impact that these molecules have on attenuating dopamine, I was thinking about that as another, another area of yeah. possible impact and application. I'm curious about um, the impacts on mood in, in that sense. And, and I wonder because, you know, clinically what we see a lot in concurrent disorder psychiatry is the combination of stimulant use disorder, opioid use disorder, and then stimulant induced psychosis. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, once all of that kind of is treated, sometimes the downstream mood impacts end up being really impactful on quality of life. And so what you were showing there with the impact on uh, dopamine signaling and attenuation, I think might, uh, in the clinical sense, maybe like once we get to do see it on more people in these, you know, the complex patients that we care for, there might be some really interesting and helpful clinical impacts there as well. Yeah, that, thank you for that question. It's a great question. And um, so in our, in our preclinical models, we're obviously extending this research. And one of our objectives is to model if, to the best we can, sort of emotional correlates of withdrawal in the rat. And there is, a, there is a protocol that allows us to do that. It's called condition place aversion. So what we're predicting is that Hiantos, uh, like, and what you do is you pair an environment with the experience of withdrawal, and then the animal avoids that environment. So what we're going to do is give Hiantos during that pairing of withdrawal with that environment and see whether we can eliminate the aversion that builds up for the environment that you that you associate with your withdrawal experience, uh, so we'll let the data tell us whether that happens or not. But uh, theoretically, I mean, again, we went through it quickly. But Hiantos by itself is elevating dopamine. Okay, uh, and we think if you have the right dose, uh, it's doing that in a manner that does not involve the inhibition of the D2 postsynaptic receptors, which of course would um, potentially modulate mood. I think it may be a, a slightly mood elevating compound, but we have no evidence for that. We don't, it, it doesn't seem to be powerful enough to create a preference for an environment where the animal experienced it. But there is some definite up modulation of dopamine here that could be useful in a number of different settings. Before my power went off, the point I was going to make is we're just about to embark on a really important experiment from my perspective. I mentioned the fact that you get hyperalgesia in withdrawal from opioid dependence. We're doing an experiment now to see whether or not that hyperalgesia will be immediately um, reduced by treatment with Hiantos. And Puya, if that's the case, 
and we can get evidence for that, we'll have the evidence within the next month or two, then that would give us great confidence to, to, to take this more directly into your pain, the pain side of this application. So, so it may be, you know, triangulated, it may have an effect on pain. It may facilitate uh, withdrawal from dependence on opioids. And this uh, question now is whether it might have some mild mood enhancing effect. So the wonderful thing about having the Health Canada license is that this allows us now, so we have permission to import Hiantos and to give it to individuals, ideally, I think initially under clinical supervision. Um, and then we're gonna see, you know, in people, this is the beauty of this reverse translation back to the preclinical science and then bringing it forward again, uh, you know, with Puya's assistance and Michael's assistance and all their colleagues. And we can start to see whether this is really um, uh, going to be a game changer in the treatment of many aspects of opioid dependence. But also, as you certainly aware of, as an advanced resident, that uh, mood has uh, all the different components uh, in, in terms of affecting it. And uh, what we would like to, to uh, explore in the next step of research, next phase of research, are the clinical effects on Hyantos uh, on all different components. So, like, so um, make sure that we are on the safe side, that there are no adverse events, which we are very optimistic. Uh, then uh, figure out what the effect of on craving may be. So, does it has a long term effect on on on, on substance use uh, issue? Um, uh, try to test effects on pain especially and on uh, also on um, let's say emotional balance and uh, and and mood um, but uh, we already so there are reports from uh, from the experience in Vietnam which I find uh, encouraging so they're using antos mainly in an outpatient setting and and, and to withdraw opiate dependent patients in their families so that means, then actually they are kind of also emotionally stable enough to, uh, to do that. And we also see um, a, um, a decrease in use of stimulants, what they would crave. But the patterns of substance use in Asia are quite different to, uh, to uh, Vancouver. So that's also something we would like to learn. I see um, the opportunity also that Hyantas may make sense beyond opiates. So like in terms of withdrawal of, of tobacco, which obviously is the most dangerous uh, psychotropic substance at all, and also in withdrawal of stimulants. So that could be another quite exciting uh, field uh, because as you know, uh, withdrawal of stimulants is uh, quite tricky. It's interesting because um, just to pick up on that point, Michael and um, Rebecca, like, we do see this concept of attenuated withdrawal where people are outside of the acute withdrawal phase, but they describe feeling just low and not sort of having the capacity to experience joy as they did previously. And, and you know, the, the hypothesis could be that they're at this dopamine attenuated uh, state for a long period of time while the neurotransmitters maybe rebalance. So like if, we, do we, can we use a compound that may reverse this? Not only like Michael was saying with regards to opioid use, but in other uh, sort of um, illicit substances such as stimulants, methamphetamine, cocaine, and um, nicotine to try to help reverse this or minimize this uh, protracted withdrawal period. Because this is really the period where they've detoxed, they might be under agonist therapy but they're at a very, very high risk of relapse because they're just not able to experience the same level of joy that they did previously. So, yeah. And that makes me think too of clinically the, um, the kind of self-reported intolerance or side effects that are kind of like what you're describing that get attributed to Suboxone or Methadone That's right. or like something else. And so like to be able to actually treat, and it mm -hmm. sounds like really, promising as far as being, you know, tolerable and even um, to not be a prescription medication to be kind of of a different class, I think would be 
like would be nice as well. Your son is also supported. So. <laughs> yeah, good, good, good move, good move. <laughs> okay, other additional questions? Uh, please uh, use the opportunity. Okay. Well, the obvious question, I should bring this up because somebody's probably thinking about it, is okay, if you have a substance that could be mood enhancing, may work on the opioid and, and may provide some opioid-like effects, um, may increase dopamine, is it addictive? You know, it, it, can you develop dependence tolerance to it? Um, you know, I think that's, that's a real question that we need to be aware of when, when talking about a sort of new compound that may have all of these effects. Yeah. So, very, right. very quickly, um, we haven't seen two things. One is we're not seeing any tolerance or even sensitization. Uh, we've given Hiantos for 15 days and we've compared the first time we gave it to the seventh and then the 15th or 14th uh, administration. The amount of increase in dopamine that we get is consistent every time. Uh, we've also s looked at the effects of Hiantos on the increase in dopamine produced by morphine itself, and it actually attenuates it. And then in tests of looking for the addictive properties, the ones we use for uh, checking out um, even opioids or stimulants, place preference, there's absolutely no sign of place preference when the animals are just simply given hiantos. And nor is there any evidence in the 10,000 people. I mean, you know, the, the Vietnamese would be millionaires if all of a sudden this stuff was a mood enhancer. Nobody who's an opioid addict in Vietnam is surreptitiously trying to get uh, Hiantos on the black market. So <laughs> it's a very important question that you're raising, uh, and I'm making light of it a little bit because we have absolutely no evidence that this compound has those properties. So that's another reason why we have confidence about undertaking properties. And I'm a firm believer in small steps. So I want this... Uh, to be used under proper, proper clinical supervision initially. So we can see for ourselves that there's no harm and there are indeed real prospects of, uh, of help and assistance for the people that need it. So and I'm really excited now that we can bring this forward as a legitimate option, I think, for um, you know, potential use in all these complex disorders. And then we just let the data tell us whether it works or not you know, proceeding cautiously and with the patient's best interest in mind. And let's find out, you know, we may have a made in Canada and Vietnam solution to this worldwide, okay. worldwide problem. Okay, so we have three minutes left now. With, or George, you have one minute for a question. That's a simple question. Um, what are major side effects and if, if there are any contraindications for using uh, Hiantos? The only thing that we've seen, and, and this again is reported in the Vietnamese studies with humans, uh, depending on the dose, it's sedative. And uh, we don't know the degree to which uh, it is sedative. It hasn't been studied uh, systematically. And so that's one of the first things that we would look at. Um, but it's a mild sedation. Um, and and, and I, yeah, again, not being a clinician, I can see a real benefit to that feature. Uh, in the initial phase of withdrawal. That might be one of the reasons why the people are transitioning if they're mildly sedative during the, say, first 24 or 48 hours after withdrawing from opioids. Um, but that's the only contraindication. The other, the drug that, the single molecule that I referred to in my talk, L-tetrahydropalmatine, um, is studied as a single molecule and at very high doses, there are some contraindications. Uh, and those are about three times the dose, which isn't a big therapeutic window, but nevertheless, it's three times, three to five times the dose that is effective in uh, producing analgesia and also uh, facilitating withdrawal. So these are the things that we have to pay special attention to. This uh, is one of the reasons why Michael and I are so excited about bringing this into the clinic because we can hopefully, you know, get the evidence that this is indeed safe um, and, and has the positive effects that we're anticipating. But at the same time, you know, we're looking for any evidence that, 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 that contraindicates its use. 
So we're at that stage right now, which I think is the responsible. But there are some. There are also some uh, clinical data from from Vietnam in the five years after the regulation, uh, where they have by law to report any adverse event uh, to the Ministry of Health. Um, there was no, not one serious adverse event reported. So, in uh, as Tony. Uh, alluded to that about uh, 10,000 and more cases uh, of patients treated with it. So that's also a, a, a very good environment. So let me summarize in terms of a vision. We would, uh, as, as researchers, we would love um, to um, touch on the, the different areas we already mentioned here in terms of effects. Uh, to uh, get a little bit uh, um, more, not a little bit, to, to really evaluate what the most interesting areas of uh, use for Antos will be and might be, and how to include it in different therapeutic approaches. And for that, we will come up with some um, more specific uh, strategies of data collection and, and intervention across the range of clinical research and we're working on a few things and we hope really that you um, continue to be interested in that and that we are able in a close collaboration with our colleagues in, uh, in CPAS and probably other programs uh, to um, not, uh, yeah, beyond the great work of clinical pharmacology to actually provide the clinical proof of um, of the effectiveness of a new ingredient, which would, or is desperately needed, uh, I would say. So um, thank you very much for participating. I was, uh, uh, nobody had really lunch as I could uh, observe. Uh, I was uh, surprised because Puya told me it's a, a lunch hour premium here. Um, but uh, I, we, we all know it's in your busy day to, uh, sneak out and and and, and listen to um, some uh, very um, high level um, research activities. Very thank you very much, and hoping to collaborate with you. And if you're interested, we will send out for everybody who wants it. We will send out slides, uh, papers, and uh, the video recording. Uh, if you uh, contact. Um, Desi for that, so the uh, kind person who sent you the link, then we happy to share the material which could then lead further and could be shared uh, among your colleagues. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.